Um, I'm, I'm, I can chill for a bit. Uh, I know, like, people are far away, so if you trust that the folks here can serve as your proxy, uh, I'm, I will welcome some questions that you might have that follow on from the talk that I just gave, or just come in from anywhere in, in the universe. Okay, but if we sit back down again, just because I, I like that, that, that vibe. Uh, does someone have a question? I'll repeat the question so we all hear. Sir. Make, or if you could sit down back on the grass. Thanks. So the AMA story, I was... I said I'm an academic, I'm culturally an academic, and I'm wired as an academic, and one of the things an academic cares about is learning. And so when someone asked, what drives me? What, how, do, how do I derive meaning in life? Okay, that was one of the questions. Where do I get my meaning? How do I find meaning in life? What I said was, so many people, when confronted with that challenge, operate on the assumption that meaning is something that they find under the rock. I found meaning, now I have meaning. The most fulfilled people I know are those who do not look for meaning from outside of themselves, but create meaning from within. And so what do I do? For me, my two highest forms of meaning are, one, that I know more about the natural world tomorrow than I know today. That's an academic credo, okay? And, I, and, and for those who stop learning more tomorrow than today, what, what becomes of you? You just kind of, you, you, you stagnate intellectually, emotionally, physically should always know something more tomorrow than today. Second, as best as is possible, take time, however small, to lessen the suffering of others. That gives meaning to my life. I've, I've already picked out my epitaph, inspired by this fact. A quote from Horace Mann, it's an educator, Har there's a school named after him too, Horace Mann. He said, be ashamed to die until you have scored some victory for humanity. That is something I believe we should all live by. That's my answer to you. We have six people here holding up a sign saying, we are the physics club. So we have <laughs> physics in the house. Now notice, they're sitting under a tree. Okay? That's okay when the sun is out, not when it's lightning. Okay, so they, they got that one figured out. Can you speak loud and I'll hear you. Go. Uh, what about inner space? You mean your brain? Oh, you don't know what you mean. Okay. So, <laughs> an inner space, the oceans? The intersection between the environment and consciousness. The intersection between the environment and consciousness. Okay. Uh, sir, someone just accused you of being a liberal arts major. In the of, I just heard that right here. <laughs> no, no, so here. Um, if you go to the bookstore and go to the science section and look for books on gravity, okay, just find the physics shelf, look for books on gravity, there's like four books on the shelf. Go look for books on consciousness in the sort of the biology section, in the human section. It's shelf after shelf after shelf. When people keep writing about a subject, there is no greater evidence that they have no clue what they're talking about. <laughs> we understand gravity enough to fit it into three books. We're done. We're on to the next problem. Okay? So, to combine the environment, which is something we all know and understand and has tangibility, with something that people are still trying to figure out, and then ask, where is that frontier? I can't go there because we don't even understand consciousness yet. 
And maybe consciousness is not something that needs to be explained. Just because you can put the words together, the nouns and verbs and adjectives, in the right sequence so that it sounds like a question, it does not mean it's a question. Okay? It can be a question. No, I, I mean this seriously. There are some communities that will accept any question at all. Like, what is the square root of a pork chop? And they go deep into that. And they... What is the sound of one hand clapping? They go deep into that. I don't have time for that. I'm glad other people do. But in my experience, questions such as that do not actually advance our understanding of the universe. So until we understand consciousness better, the day we do, then come back and ask that question again, maybe I'll have an answer. Or maybe that question will never get asked again. <laughs> May, I'm just saying, maybe one or the other of those two will happen. Yes, right here, in dark shades. Louder. You mentioned planetary resources. Yes. What do you think it means for the future of NASA and both public and private space travel? I mentioned planetary resources. What does that mean for the future of NASA and public and private uh, space exploration. Excellent question. First of all, planetary resources, I commented on that on The Daily, on the daily Show. <laughs> yeah. I, I get, it was a two-word reply, actually, is what that was. You gotta look that one up when you get the chance. Uh, this, so this, some billionaires got together. We all heard of them, Jeff Bezos and, and Jim Cameron. You know, he called me a son of a bitch. Did you know that? Because I made him change the sky over the sinking Titanic. Because he got it wrong. So in the, in the version of the story where they included every word that he spoke, which was not all new, some news, uh, news sources edited what he said. Uh, he, he said, yeah, he kept after me at it, and that son of a bitch, you know, he called me a son of a bitch. But it was in a loving way, because he ultimately did change the sky over the sinking ship to be the correct sky, not the half-assed, made-up sky that he put there, thinking nobody would notice. So, uh, this, this, so they want to go mine natural resources off of asteroids. Uh, if you bring an asteroid uh, maybe the size of this garden here, that's metallic, it'll contain more platinum than has ever been mined in the history of the world. Same would go for iridium. It would almost be true for gold. Some asteroids have water. You would mine the water and hand it to NASA in space, because otherwise NASA has to launch that water from Earth's surface into space. It costs $10,000 a pound to launch something into low Earth orbit. $50,000 a pound to get it to the moon's distance. If you can get water from an asteroid, hand it to NASA in space, charge them $30,000, NASA saves money, you make, make $30,000. Okay, this could be the first project ever to turn billionaires into trillionaires. <laughs> now, uh, the guy who developed the Tesla, uh, Elon Musk, and he's also the CEO of SpaceX, he's famous for saying, you want to make a small fortune in space? Start with a big fortune. <laughs> so it's not obvious that this will turn a profit. It's not obvious. Somebody's got to do it, though, because space has unlimited resources. Here we are killing each other because you happen to be living over a part of Earth's crust that has one resource and not another. If, if aliens came and landed here and I told them the stuff we were doing, I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> you say, well, how are you getting your energy? Well, we're pulling fossil fuels out of the ground. Will that run out one day? Yeah, that'll run out one day. Do you have a plan? No. <laughs> and then it'll be gone. <laughs> Where are you getting your metals? Well, we're pulling them out of the crust, too. We have whole astro... We're not... We got a space program, but we're not there yet. We don't... If you have a whole suite of launch vehicles, you do science on Mars, you do tourist jaunts to the moon, you do mining on asteroids, you visit the Lagrangian point where all the forces balance, we can build huge structures there, you, you go check out Europa, look for life, and you might want to also check out an asteroid that could be headed our way. Maybe protecting 
human beings from extinction could work for you in terms of a funding plan, right? Because <laughs> you know that if the dinosaurs had a space program, they would have used it. <laughs> I gotta tell you, really funny. The dinosaurs went extinct. You know, an asteroid the size of Mount Everest struck the Yucatan Peninsula, what is now Mexico. And that, it, it took out 70% of the world's species. And I described this to an audience. And I said, it, it hit the Yucatan Peninsula, but back then, the dinosaurs didn't call it Mexico. I, I said that, <laughs> and somebody replied, uh, they called it Mexico. <laughs> I thought that was funny, I don't know. So, so there is a place for commercial enterprise. They will never lead a space frontier? I've seen comments on the internet say, oh, Tyson is a dinosaur in this. Of course they have to lead this. They're not reading my whole comment. They must not have been. Because I hardly ever, it made, contrary to what it ever has sounded like this afternoon, I hardly ever express opinions. I know, I know, I know. What I do is I give you an if-then statement, okay? And the causes and effects of things, and you take ownership of it. I don't need to be referenced as you think about what I shared with you, okay? I'll give you a perfect example. I am quoted on t-shirts. This is not related to space, but it's an excellent example of how people think I come out with opinions, but in fact, I don't. There's a t-shirt and it says, quoting me, God is an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. Neil deGrasse Tyson, okay? Now, those words actually came out of my mouth, but it's not, it's not how it came out. It started out as, if you, if you assign God to every place where science has yet to tread, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. That's an if statement that has nothing to do with me. It is, a, it, is a, it is a true statement if that's how you define God. But people took the second part of that. It, it came out sounding like I'm ready to have a fight when I'm just given a sentence for you to contend with, okay? So, with space, the private enterprise cannot lead the frontier because the frontier is expensive, the frontier is dangerous, it has unquantified risks. If you put all three of those factors together, you cannot exist in the capital markets because to raise capital requires someone plunks down money and you say, here is your return on that investment. If you don't know how risky it is, you don't know what it's gonna cost because you've never done it before, you cannot create a capital valuation of that market. Governments do that. They have always done it. Columbus was not, there was some private money in it, but it was Queen Isabella's directive. He draws the map. He goes where the good Indians are and the bad Indians are. He draws where the edge of the world is. There was no edge of the world. He shows where the trade winds are. He comes back, reports on this. Then the Dutch East India Trading Company kicks in. Then commercial enterprise takes over. This is what happened in the West. Gingrich got this wrong in one of his speeches. He said, we don't give the money to NASA. Give it to private enterprise because they'll lead the space frontier. No. And he likened it to the railroads across the West. Lewis and Clark preceded the railroads. All right? Jefferson Payne, find us where the valleys are, where the rivers are, where the mountains are. Map it. Describe it. Bring it back. Talk about it. Acquire the land. Then the railroads came. That's how it is. That's how it's always been. So, there is certainly a place for private enterprise. My read of history tells me it is never on the actual frontier of what has never been done before. Unless it's a vanity project, but then it's not a business case. It's, no, it's not business. It's, it's do it because you can afford it, not because you expect a return on your money. I'm sorry, I took so long to answer his question. <laughs> do, do you mind if my answers are long, or should I, short, should I sound bite them? No, we're good. Uh, you like the long end? Okay. Okay, and remember, the folks here are kind of proxy for all you guys back there, okay? So if they mess up, just deal with them later. Oh. Oh, someone asked, how does it feel to be a meme? I don't know. It 
it's first. It's a hundred percent creepy. Uh, it's a, and fifty percent weird. And 25%, I just don't really understand it. So I'm, I'm flattered because basically the meme is, is a celebration. It's not, you know, there's some ways that people can be mean-spirited. And, and I, I haven't found that with the meme. I'm, so I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm enchanted by it. But, uh, so like I said, it's, it's, it's creepy. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's go uh, right here, sir, in the black shirt. Yes, loud. What area of science or mathematics should have more emphasis in schools? What area of science and mathematics should have more emphasis in schools? I can answer that. Every area. <laughs> of science and yeah. No, no, wait, no. I don't. I'm not saying that just to be politically correct. Consider the following. <laughs> you walk into a hospital mm. there are machines brought into the service of diagnosing the condition of the human body do you realize 100% of those machines are based on a principle of physics discovered by a physicist who had no interest in medicine at all what happens is they discover a physical principle and this was started ever since electricity what do you think the EK, EKG is? It's monitoring electrical impulses. The medical community has been highly exploitive of the discoveries of other fields. And it is the two together that is what today we call modern medicine. There are people who are saying, we don't need physics anymore. We want to live healthy lives. Let's fund only the National Institutes of Health. Put the money right there. That's the Band-Aid thing. Put the Band-Aid. Put money right there and then we'll live longer. Do you realize the MRI, that's probably the most uh, potent instrument we have today to diagnose your condition without cutting you open? The magnetic resonance imager, that's based on a principle of physics called the nuclear magnetic resonance, discovered by a physicist, happened to be my physics professor in college. I had nothing, I'm just saying, he just happened to be there. <laughs> he got the Nobel Prize for that, he studied the the behavior of atomic nuclei in the presence of a magnetic field. He got the Nobel Prize. A medical technician says, wait a minute. I can take this and make a machine and put your body in, and there you have it. You can't script this. Do you realize that when the electron was discovered, people spent decades wondering if it would have any utility or use at all? Do you realize when, I, when, when, when uh, Albert Einstein first wrote down the equations for the stimulated emission of radiation? Was he thinking to himself, barcodes, yes! <laughs> Einstein wrote down the first equation that enabled the laser, the light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. It is one of the first, right along with SCUBA, one of the first and greatest of the acronyms out there. <laughs> So you can't script it. You do all the frontier. And what you need are programs that can cross-pollinate those discoveries. Then we can all benefit in ways undreamt of and unimagined. And the last example I'll give here, so suppose you are an expert in thermodynamics, the study of heat, and I hand you a Franklin potbelly stove, and I say, here's a billion dollars, perfect this stove and you might put some insulation on the side and the venting will be a little better. Maybe you won't use wood, you'll use coal. Or maybe not coal, but natural gas. Or maybe not gas, but electricity. You invent a thermal probe so you can know when the food is done. You can create a convective cell. You do all of this, and no matter how hard you try, you will never invent a microwave oven because it doesn't come out of that line of thinking. Our microwave ovens came from the development of the Klystron in the Second World War. Communication technologies, not technologies to heat your food. <laughs> so this cross-pollination is everything. And in fact, it defines the existence of the iPod and the smartphones. It's got Jeep. <laughs> You guys are slick. Whoa! <laughs> Give this guy a hand. Whoa! Whoa! I missed like two and a half seconds on that one. <laughs>
I could have just, it's like a relay, you know, just. <laughs> as I was saying. <laughs> so uh, this cross-pollination is important. You fund all the sciences. Otherwise, we're going nowhere. Time for just a few more questions. Again, you guys are proxy for everyone else. So your questions got to be awesome. Yes, sir, right here. Yes. Wait, wait, you began that question with an um, and we are educated folk here, so I will dock you one question. We'll come back to you. When we do, don't begin your sentence with um, okay? Because if I don't hold you to this, the rest of your life will. We'll come back to you. Someone with a red shirt back there. Yes, sir. Was that? Did he begin with um? Yeah. Go, wait, okay, go. What do I think of Elon Musk's comment that he can send people to Mars for $500,000? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to put me back on that game show on The Daily Show, right? Because it was uh, BS or no BS was my, the questions I were asked. No, that, I think that's entirely, it's very wishful. Wishful, and, but entirely unrealistic by way of any current or foreseeable technology. But, some, but, but by the way, this asteroid mining venture and some statements such as that have just the right amount of crazy in them <laughs> so that you say, all right, I'm not going to get in your way. Go ahead and try. But I ain't helping you pay for this, all right? You just try it. If it works, I'll, I'll come behind. Right? So they have just the right amount of crazy, but just the right amount of you want it to be true. That you'll, And there's no law of physics that prevents it. If there's no law of physics that prevents it, let it go. Let them try it. If they try to say, we're going to build a perpetual motion machine, and we're going to self-propel without, with, and we're going to violate five laws of Newton, I'm saying, you know, I have time for this. Right? So, so, so it's one thing to not violate a law of physics. It's another thing to believe you have the secret to the universe for having done so. And he's got, he just has, he believes he can do it. I'm not gonna stand in his way. Uh, back to the, wait, wait, no, you, what, what, right here, sir. Our um, we're gonna give the um man a chance again. What do you plan on adding to it and what kind of roles do you see popular science and things like that playing? The question is, and thanks for mentioning it, he heard that I will be um, hosting a 21st century reboot of Carl Sagan's Cosmos. So thank you. Thanks for mentioning it. It's, it's been 32 years since that came out. And I don't even have any turtlenecks to wear. To, 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 <laughs> but I did practice this. I'll say, billions and billions. I can, I can do that. Um, so, what we saw from the original series is that there were a lot of things that were just sort of ordinary science, which you can now get by virtue of many different documentaries on black holes and relativity and the search for life. So we're going to downplay the stuff you can get from other documentaries. Because today, documentaries are quite common. They were not common back then. But what made Cosmos stick with us was the fact that the messaging was not simply, here's science, isn't it's fun. It's, here's science, here's why it matters to you, and here's why your science literacy matters to the fate of our species and of the world. That is the messaging that matters. It brings science into your living room, not as something to know, but as something to feel. And not as something to recite back, but something to understand so that you can be empowered with that level of knowledge, awareness, and wisdom. That is what is our target going forward. We go uh, right here, sir. When you die, what is your, what is your positive best case scenario vision of the future? When I die, what is my positive best case scenario for the future? Um, why do I have to die? <laughs> Why is that a prerequisite for me giving a positive best case scenario for the future? In 50 years, right, I'll, okay. I just don't know what, what my death has to do with my imagining a future. Okay, so. 
Okay. Robot, you know. So, uh, all right, you want to bring my death into it? Okay, so here we go. <laughs> I've written in my memoir that when I die, I do not want to be cremated. When you are cremated, the energy content of your body, it's chemical energy, it's, it's why you exist as a life form. There's chemical energy built into the molecules of your body. If you cremate, the bonds of those molecules are broken, heat is created, and the heat radiates to the universe. Yes, your energy is returned to the universe. Yes, that's poetic. However, <laughs> I want to be buried, not cremated. Because when you're buried, your body becomes the food for flora and fauna, the likes of which I have dined upon and have granted me nourishment throughout my life. So in death, I want to give my body's energy content back to the earth from whence it came. That is what I want to do when I die. Now, what kind of future do I want to be around? What is my vision? Here's my vision. I'm going to tell you. Here's my vision. Here's my vision. I think there's a, there's a conduct, there's a treaty being bandied about right now to control the conduct of spacefaring nations in space. The peaceful use of space. And everyone is very hopeful about this because they want all activities in space to be peaceful. I am not hopeful for that. You know why? Because what does it mean for, okay, down here we'll kill each other, but up there we won't. Like, what, what, what does that mean? If, if you can figure out how to not kill each other in space, why not figure out how to do that here on Earth? Okay, if you can succeed, then start with Earth, okay? Start with Earth. All right, so now, I imagine that since most wars in history have been because of limited access to resources of one power versus another, and given that the universe itself has unlimited resources, it might be that exploration of the universe itself is the first and only recipe ever to rid our species of the urge to kill one another with organized violence. So my vision for the future is possibly a world without war enabled by the resources of space. And if that doesn't do it, here we are killing each other, but then the asteroid comes and it's on its way and it'll render us all extinct. So at some point you're gonna have to stop killing each other and band together and protect Earth. So if we can't figure out how to stop killing each other, I wanna urge the asteroid to come sooner rather than later. <laughs> that might be the only hope of the end of war on this planet. We got a couple more, uh, right there with the glasses, yes. What is the most important thing I've ever learned? That became a viral YouTube video six weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, so you weren't paying attention to me. Uh, what you do is Google uh, most amazing fact. Astounding. Excuse me, most astounding fact. <laughs> <laughs> I got it wrong. The most astounding fact, I did an interview with Time Magazine back in 2008. They asked me 10 questions that the public had submitted to them. One of them was, what's the most astounding fact? So I just answered it. And there it languished for like years until I give a testimony in front of the Senate a couple of months ago after my recent book came out on space. By the way, a lot of this is just in that uh, cheap commercial here. A lot of that's in that book in the space book, just so you know. Uh, so, uh, so, where was I? You're telling us to Google something. So, so, so somebody, I don't know who, took my answer to that, dolled it up with cosmic space images, and put a soundtrack, I mean a musical track to it, and it's really cool. It's, and and it, got, it went everywhere. It's like rising through three million views. And, and so, I mean, it's, it's viral for me. I don't know, not for Lady Gaga. Uh, so, um, so just Google that and you'll get what I, in my judgment, is the most uh, important 
scientific fact that exists in any scientific field. It's right there. So let's take like three more questions and we'll call it an afternoon. Oh, well, there's some questions from behind here because they've just been looking at this part of me the whole time. I'm going to turn around. Okay, come back here. Okay, wait a minute, there's a beer here. Let me get a swig of this first. Okay. All right, we're good. But this question is coming from someone who has a chart of the periodic tab table of elements on his chest. Okay, go. How can a regular person spread their love of science to others? If you have a periodic table of elements on your chest, you are not a regular person. <laughs> so, so uh, how, can, uh, how can people spread the love? I think the fact that certain videos go viral that people love and they have science content, the fact that some people write op-eds celebrating discoveries in space, the fact that people put pressure on our lawmakers, People ask me, what would you do if you were head of this and senator that? I said, no, I don't want to be any of that. As an educator, I want to influence the public so that they can choose a leader that fulfills their mandate. Because if all you do is influence a politician, then two years later, somebody else is in that political seat and you got to influence the next one. Whereas, if it is the public's mandate, then the politician becomes irrelevant to that fact because whoever occupies that spot has to fulfill what the electorate wants and so when space exploration becomes a cultural mandate of the electorate it won't matter who's in charge because they will have to do what we tell them to do and that would be to ensure that we are a space faring nation evermore in front of the, the baby high chair. Yes. Me? All right. You're standing in front of the baby high chair. <laughs> uh, what is rolled up on your left sleeve? Cigarettes. Cigarettes rolled up. Are you like Fonzie or something? Are you? <laughs> this is like very 1957. No okay. Okay, wait, is there a question? No, 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 no. Oh, my, my, my question? We're trying to get a question out of this. Okay. My question is, what are the ethics and what are the uh, like morals that we have to also put hand in hand with scientific training? Okay, so the question is, an important question, uh, what are the ethics and what are the morals that should be in place adjacent to scientific discovery and scientific activities? At the center of his concern is that we are part of a fundamentally capitalist culture. And so, and, and so, yeah, when you're a capitalist, your priorities are not the good of the many, right? They're the wealth of the few. And so we have some laws to protect the many, all right? Maybe they're not always as effective as they need to be or should be, but maybe, then maybe we need some extra laws there. But I can tell you, this concern about sort of the moral, um, I see no moral problems with mining an asteroid if we have no moral problems mining Earth, okay? So if you had a problem mining Earth, then you'd have an argument against mining asteroids. And then I would say, uh, and I'm a capitalist, I'm not born and raised here, I kind of embrace that, but I would say, you have the choice to live without the resources that mining brings you, okay? And people do live that way. I think the Amish community lives that way. You, you can go hang out with the Amish, no one is gonna stop you. <laughs> but I kind of like my iPod, you know, I kind of like the GPS. I kind of like the idea that we can get platinum off of an asteroid because the universe is unlimited. What we do have is something called a planetary protection system because we don't want to contaminate a planet with life from here if we're looking for life on that planet. And if we're bringing samples back from other planets, we don't want to contaminate, in the Andromeda strain scenario, contaminate us with a life form from another planet. So, I wouldn't call that, that morals or ethics, but it's just good common sense. The I don't want to die driver is kicking in. Um, but otherwise, 
I can tell you that exploration in science has made more people live longer lives and healthier lives than any other effort ever invoked to try to accomplish that goal. So I can't stand here and say, I'm worried about our moral fiber going forward. There's so many other, there's so much other conduct of humans that is morally bankrupt, that has nothing to do with science, that if you were to rank what we should be paying attention to morally, science is not at the top of that list. So that, that's my reply to you, okay? <laughs> A couple more questions here. Oh, someone said, let a girl ask the question. Yes. Okay, uh, sure, right here. The University of Michigan has recently found that young girls... No, we got one right here, there's a question right here. Yes, go on. That young girls are not attracted to entering into STEM fields because of the stereotypes of female scientists. And will we have bastions of rocket ships ready to go to Mars? How can we inspire change for the youngest generation right now. She's citing a study by the University of Michigan which found that young girls are disproportionately discouraged by whatever cultural forces from entering the STEM fields and how can we move forward until, until the day where we have this writ large headlines influencing ambitions, what do we do between now and then to attract all people, all underrepresented uh, people, women especially, into these fields. I can tell you there's been some progress in astrophysics, we're about 40% female. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good trend line from what it had been. Uh, biology is more than half women. Uh, chemistry is down maybe about a third. Uh, theoretical physics is really low, okay? Uh, so there's still, there's still room for improvement there. Uh, what I think is that there's, because of the internet, and chat rooms and all these communities that have risen up with people who are total strangers. Do you know about the skeptics? You know about the skeptics? Skeptics, you go, these are women who are like smart and like science and like guys who like science, okay? And they talk freely about it and they are not ashamed and they will wear their periodic table of elements proudly on their chest, okay? And so, so there is a community, and I see that rising, and it's all the signs are good. So if we just keep doing that, I have good confidence that we will have the society we would have imagined, that Martin Luther King would have imagined in 1963. How about from up there in the, in the, in the peanut gallery? Did any of you guys just up there have a question? No, okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the last question, so it's good. better be awesome. But well, we got, does he have a question? Do you have a question? Okay. No, I, I, talk, I got a kid right here I'm talking to, right here. Do you have a question? Come on up. Okay. Huh? Yeah. You have a question? Okay, you got a question? Did you have a question? Stay friend? I can come back to you. Want me to come back? <laughs> Mulling over his next question. We'll get back to you. And I'll be around. We'll find you. Okay, one last question. Are we ready? Have you been to the CERN reactor? <laughs> uh, have I been to the CERN reactor in Switzerland? Uh, no, I stood on the shores of America crying that we never funded our superconducting super collider. Okay, so. Which, by the way, would have been three times the power of the CERN collider in Switzerland. And we would have been doing this back in the 1990s. But its budget got cut entirely in 1991 after there were some budget overruns, and in 93, budget overruns, and they said, we can't afford this. Of course we could have afforded it. We afforded it for most of the 20th century. Why couldn't we afford it in the early 90s? Because in 1989, Peace broke out in Europe. <laughs> Where there isn't a war, there isn't a way. Last question. Green shirt. You are the last question of this afternoon, sir. Go. He started with um. No. Okay. <laughs> was that mean of me? I was mean. Okay, go.
Okay, how is NASA making a transition from the, the traditional fuels, chemical fuels, to more innovative propulsion, I would suppose? Okay, uh, it's not. Okay. Uh, I can't end on that. <laughs> it's just not. It used to have an innovation propulsion division. They cut the budget for that. It's not doing innovation propulsion now. It is still burning chemical fuels. No warp drive, no ion drive, none of this. Where are we? La I, one last question. How about there, right there, Arts, right, next to the lamppost. Go. And by the way, how old are you? That's okay. Uh, how old are you? I can't hear you? You're 10 years old. Okay. When I was 10, I was like checking out the universe. So thanks for coming to this. And we will end on your question, which puts awesome responsibility on the kind of question you ask. Just to put pressure on you. Go. What was the question? Oh, why didn't I work, go to, okay. <laughs> he knows part of my profile. Uh, when I was in high school, I was invited to visit Cornell by Carl Sagan to check out the campus, because I had been admitted and he wanted to make sure I saw all there was to see so that I can make an informed decision about where I would attend school. I would not ultimately go to Cornell uh, to go to college. And you're asking, how come I didn't? Here's why. Here's why. Carl Sagan, at the time, who sent me a personal letter after I had applied to colleges, and my application was dripping with the universe. You knew the universe was in me. I was there. The admissions office sent that application to him, said, you might want to check this guy out. He sent me a personal letter, signed Carl Sagan. I said, this is the famous Carl. I was, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I showed it to mom and dad and sis and brother. And they said, oh, check it out. Go call him back. Go visit. <laughs> so I went to visit him at Cornell. I went up to his office. He reached back, pulled out one of the books from his shelf. It was a book he wrote. He wasn't in here. You didn't have to look. Pulled out the book. Signed it to me. I still have that book. Showed me the lab. Showed me the campus. This was a winter Saturday. I'd taken a bus up there to upstate New York from New York City. Later that afternoon, we finish. It begins to snow. He drives me back to the bus station. He says, if the bus cannot come through, here is my home phone. Call me. You can spend the night and leave tomorrow. And I said to myself, who am I? I, I'm just a kid from the Bronx, and this is Carl Sagan giving me this level of attention, concern, and care. Even though I did not ultimately go to Cornell, I'm a different person because of that one encounter. I'm a different person today because I recognized then that there is this wheel that turns, and there are people who are rising up, people who were already there, and that wheel has to keep turning. Carl Sagan knew this, and so he gives some of his busy schedule on a Saturday to me, someone he has never met, and I'm a 17-year-old kid. To this day, when students call my office, I don't care who else I'm on the line with. It's like, all right, Barack, I'll get back to you. I got some students I got to talk to. And then I talk to the students and try to give them advice that could guide them on their way. I didn't ultimately go to Cornell because I didn't want to commit four years to the existence of one person. People sometimes change campuses. People sometimes change interest. So when I chose college, I chose a college that had the broadest offering of cosmic subjects and themes. And I, I don't regret that decision, but I would still continue to uh, be an acquaintance of Carl Sagan. And today I'm working with his original collaborators on the next generation of Cosmos. And so the lesson there for me was, and it's not just in astrophysics, it's in every profession, every profession you are in, that if you are not accountable for bringing someone up behind you after you ex have succeeded, you have no business being there in the first place. And that is the academic cycle that we all need and require. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
up one more time for Neil deGrasse Tyson. Three quick things. All right, three quick things we're going to do. First, we're going to give, give away some door prizes, and we'll invite Kitty up to do that. Second, we're going to have a book signing up in the union on the second floor. Uh, we'll have a little less time to do that, but it still should be good. And, and third, for all the seniors in the audience, we have senior photos tomorrow, $5. All proceeds support the Wisconsin Idea Scholarship. Support the scholarship. It's a good cause. Thank you so much for coming on Wisconsin. Thank you for coming to the inaugural Senior Day.